Hey everybody, uh, here we're going to make some um, some inferences uh, from a random sample. And so here's our common course strand for our most awesome teachers. And our question is, how can we use a sample to make inferences about a population? That just means make uh, decisions about, about a population. So we're going to use samples. Oops, I misspelled inferences. I put too many R's in there. Let me take one out. I thought I cleared that up. I think I did. Anyway, so anyways, so we're going to use dot plots to make some uh, some some inferences or uh, golly I thought I fixed that anyway so after obtaining a random sample of a population we can make inferences about the population and make decisions about the population that's what inferences mean okay and then uh, random samples are usually representative uh, and support um, uh, our, our valid uh, decision a valid inference okay fancy word for decision here so so after obtaining a random sample of a population, we can make inferences about the population. And uh, so here we go. We're going to, we have uh, Rose. She's uh, uh, asked a random sample of her students how many books they had in their backpack. So she recorded the data as a list. So here it is right here. So, for example, um, uh, one student had, had two books in their backpack. One student had six books. One student had one. One student had zero, and so on. So these are the number of books that she uh, picked right there. So we're going to make a dot, a dot plot for the books carried by the sample of students. Okay, so a dot plot is just uh, we're going to first draw a number line from zero to six. There we go. Okay, and then we're just going to go ahead. Let me just slide that up right here. So now we're going to place dots above each number on the number line uh, for each time it appears in the data. Now let me just slide that up right there. Okay. So now what we're going to do is put a dot above each uh, number. So I'm going to put a dot above 2. So you'll see I highlight this 2 in red, and I'll put a, a red dot right here. Okay, so there it is right there. Okay, and the next one is 6. So I'm going to go ahead and put a dot above 6. The next one is 1, then 0, and then 4, and then I'm just going to keep going. 1, 4, and then I got the 2 and the 2 right there. Okay. So there's our dot plot that represents that data. So notice the dot plot puts the data values in order from smallest to biggest right there. So helps us make uh, some decisions about this or some inferences that our book likes to say. So notice uh, no students in Rose's sample carried three books. So do you think this is true for all the students at the school? Probably not. Um, uh, so I wouldn't think so. Most of the students have between one and four books, so some would likely carry three books. Uh, she just needs to sample more kids or do another sample anyway. So uh, just that one small sample, um, uh, she only found uh, that no students either had zero, I'm sorry, either had three books or five books in there. Okay, so how are the number of dots that we plotted related to the uh, the data values. Well, the dots that we plotted are the same. Each dot represents one of those data values. So they're just the same, and they put them in order, too. So complete each qualitative uh, inference about the population. Most students have between, um, uh, uh, most students, sorry, have at least one book in their backpack right here. So here, yeah, we did have a student that had zero uh, books in their backpack, and there's probably more at the school that have zero books in the backpack, but most of the students have at least one book in their back book, backpack. So uh, most students have fewer than, um, I don't know, fewer than six uh, books in their backpack, but even fewer than five books in their backpack. So I forgot. You can say six or five. It doesn't matter. I said five. So most students have between, um, uh, let's see, one and four books that are in their backpack. What, how could Rose improve her, her data uh, of, the school, uh, of the kids at the school? Well, she could um, uh, increase the size of her sampling or just uh, do more samples of the same size right there. So just one sample is, is an okay representa representation of the, of the group as long as it was random. Uh, but uh, she did more samples, uh, she'd get a better estimate, estimate of the population right there. Okay, so we're going to use uh, box plots in my old textbook. Uh, when I used to teach statistics at high school, it was called box and whisker plots. So this book calls it a box plot. So uh, we're going to use box, box plots to make uh, some decisions here, some inferences. So, okay, so we can also analyze box plots to make inferences about a population. So here we go. So the number of pets owned by a random sample of students at Churchill Middle School is shown below. Um, use the data to make the, the plot right here, a box plot. Okay, so, so uh, one student had nine uh, um, uh, 
uh, pets at home. One student had two, one student had zero, and so here's the number of pets that, uh, uh, that, um, uh, that was uh, in the sample. Uh, of the students. So we're going to order the data from least to greatest. Okay, let's do that. So I reshuffled those numbers and put them in order from least to greatest because we're going to need to do that to find uh, the, the greatest value and the least value. So here's the greatest value right here. Sorry, this is the biggest number. This is the smallest number. So here's the least number zero. And our, our box and whisker plot or box plot will include these numbers here. The median, the median is the middle number, so let's count the numbers. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So the fifth number is our median. So one, two, three, four, five. So here's the median right here. Let's just uh, slide that up right here. Okay, so now let's find uh, 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 the least and the greatest values. Okay, so the least and the greatest values are the zero and the nine, and the median is the middle number. So here it's that three right here. And then the quartiles, you guys, the lower quartile, which I call Q1, and the upper quartile, which is Q3, uh, so um, are the medians of the lower half and the upper halves, not including the median. Okay, so, so pretend like that's not here, and then here is the lower numbers right here, 0, 2, 2, 3. Here's the upper numbers, 4, 5, 6, 7. So um, there's two numbers in the middle, so we just average those two. Well, that's easy. The average of 2 and 2 is 2. But over here, the two numbers in the middle are, are 5 and 6. So right in the middle of 5 and 6 is, is 5.5. So Q1 will be 2, and Q3 will be 5.5. Okay, so there's the lower half and the upper half. And then we average those two middle numbers right here. So Q, uh, Q1 is 2 and Q3 is 5.5. Uh, okay. All right. So now we're going to draw a number line that includes all of those numbers. The minimum number, the maximum number, the two quartiles, Q1 and Q, Q3, and then the median right there. Okay. So let's go ahead and draw that. Here's a number line right there. And I'm going to put dots for all of those numbers right here. So, so here's 0 right here. So I've got a 0. Here's 9, okay, and then Q1 is 2, so here's Q1, here's Q3 at 5.5, and then the median is right there at uh, 3 right there, so, so that's all these numbers right here, okay. So, so to do the box and whisker plot, we're going to draw a box at the lower and upper quartiles, okay. Let's do this one at a time. So I'm going to draw a rectangular box at the lower quartile all the way up to the upper quartile. Okay, and then, and then inside that box, we're going to draw a vertical line down here at the median right here. Okay, so let's do that. All right, so there's the box, and then there's the median right there. And then we draw um, uh, the whiskers. They extend out to the small number and the big number right here. Okay, the small number is over here, and the big number is over here. So we're just going to draw those whiskers out. So there's a, a box and whisker plot right there. Now... I didn't see in your book that they said this, you guys, but since this is the middle number right here, that means half of the numbers are below and half of the numbers are above. So here it is right here. Here's the middle number. Can you see half the numbers are below and half the numbers are above? Okay, and then the quartiles cuts them in half again. So if you think about this, this is this is half of a half or 25%. This little piece represents 25% of the data. This little piece is 25% of the data. This piece is 25% of the data. Here's 25%. So 25, 25, 25, 25 gives us 100% of this data right up here. Okay, anyway. All right, so let's go ahead and talk to answer some questions here. The interquartile range, which is called the IQR, is just Q3 minus Q1. So it's going to be this number, 5.5, minus this number right here. So 5.5 minus 2 is 3.5. So the IQR of this number, the interquartile range, is, is uh, 3.5. Okay, so what can we see from a box plot that is not uh, readily apparent in a dot plot? Well, we can see the median value and the IQR pretty quick also. Another thing we can see is, again, the 25%. If we have a box plot, this is 25% of the data. This is 25% of the data. Remember, this is the median, so half of the numbers are below and half of the numbers are above. And this is the median of the upper half, so, so this is 25% and this is 25% right here of the numbers, of the numbers, okay? 
All right, so complete each qualitative uh, inference about uh, the population. A good measure for most, the most likely number of pets is probably going to be that median, that three right there. So 50% of the students have between, have between. Uh, remember, here's here's the median right here. So 50% of the students have between zero and three pets right there. Okay. And then 50% of the, uh, me, uh, the students have between 3 and 10 pets also. So almost every student in Churchill has at least, uh, well, they have at least zero pets, but I'm going to say at least one pet right there. So even though they didn't tell us one pet, I'm going to say at least one pet. Okay, so uh, we're going to use proportions to make some uh, inferences here. So proportions are a fraction equals a fraction, and when a fraction equals a fraction, uh, we just uh, we make them equal to each other, and that'll help us uh, make uh, some decisions. So here we go. So a shipment to a warehouse consists of 3,500 light switches. So the manager chooses at random a sample of 50 of those switches, and that manager finds that three of those are defective. So out of the 50, now notice it says random. It has to be random. Okay, if it wasn't random, you know, if he picked the ones that were just on the top or the ones that were just on the bottom, maybe in the shipment process they were getting banged around so you have to choose them at random in the in the box of uh, the 3500 switches right here so how many switches in the shipment are likely to be de defective okay so we're going to set up a proportion and it's reasonable to make a prediction about the population because the sample is random so what we're going to do is say uh, the number of defective switches that we picked in the sample and the size of the sample so this would be three and then 50 right here because uh, out of our sample right here we had three of the 50 defective right here equals how many the, uh, in the whole population and the size of the population well we know this number is 3500 okay so there's our proportion we're going to set up all right and then what we can think of is is 50 times what gets us 3500 okay or think of this five times what gets us 35 well five times seven gets us 35 but this has an extra zero in it, so it's going to be 5 times 70. I'm sorry, 50 times 70 right there. That'll get us that 3,500 right there. So that gets us 3 times 70 is 210. So of the 3,500 switches, we can make a good guesstimate that 210 switches would be uh, defective right there. Okay, so based on that sample, we can predict that about 250 of the, of the switches in that shipment would have been defective right there. All right, so how many switches in the shipment uh, could we predict if the damage if it was six switches in the sample instead of the three switches right there? Well, if it's still 50 in the, in the sample that we did and six of them were defective, since we knew that 210 switches gave us uh, from the three defective switches, okay, right down here, since uh, we had three of the 50 defective right here, this is going to be six of the 50 that are defective. So what we can do, six is double three, so we can double uh, that 210 right there. So uh, a good estimation would be 410 switches would be damaged. So how can we estimate uh, to check if our answer is reasonable? Okay, well six, you guys, is just a little bit more than 10%. I'm going to go ahead and put that up there. It's a little bit more than 10% of 50. Five is 10% of 50, and six is a little bit more than 10% of 50. So 10% of 3,500 is 350, and so a little bit more than that is 420. Okay, so that would be a, a good uh, reason to, um, a nice estimate to make sure that we were correct on that. All right, you guys, I hope that makes sense, and, and take care.